For the record, I once visited one of the 50 or so micronations. They tend to come and go, by the way. The quirky thing was, I had no intention of stepping onto or even knowledge of the Republic of Kugel Moogle until I perchanced upon the place walking in a park in Vienna, Austria. Although stepping on to its soil would have been fairly hard since there was a rusty barbed wire fence surrounding the country on all sides. You are now looking at the entirety of the Republic of Kugel Moogle. It wasn't built on that site that it is today, rather a village outside the city. The person who constructed what was essentially an art studio, Edwin Lipberger, got into a dispute with his local council as to its design. This sparked him to start Kugel Moogle, the sphere on the hill. The rest of the village sided with him. Instantly he had 600 citizens. Ultimately he did time for tax evasion though. Sealand, 12 kilometres off the coast of England in the channel, is arguably the best known micronation. That, by the way, is a decommissioned World War II sea fort and not an oil rig. Patty Bates took it over in 1967 with the same idea as those in the movie The Boat That Rocked, starred a pirate radio station with impunity, only he took a fancy to having his own serfdom. The king of his surrounds, the equivalent of two tennis courts. The radio station never went to air and the Principality of Sealand still exists today with Bates's son Michael as its current prince. Have a rat around at YouTube for the videos on Sealand. It has a wild history from the kidnapping of German tourists, a deal to open a tax-free casino that went sour, to those behind Pirate Bay file sharing wanting to buy it and operate there as a free haven. I've read your mind. I know exactly what you're going to say. The independent republic of Fungamomona is in our backyard. Indeed, it is our very own homegrown flourishing micronation. Has been so since 1st of November 1989. When the locals got pissed off, their township was being shifted out of the Taranaki district into the Manawatu Wanganui. Billy Lee was the township's president between 1999 and 2001. He's the goat, by the way. The better looking one in the snap. Ty the Poodle was the president between 2003 until 2004. She survived an assassination attempt in 2003 when she was attacked by a pig dog. Three plus decades on, the Republic of Whangamamona is going strong. Not the first nation though within our borders. Six years prior to its formation, there was another all but now forgotten rebellious state in our midst, out at the heads of the Otago Harbour. The independent state of Aramoana even came with its own border post. Micro states always start with a grievance against the establishment. Want to be left alone to do your own thing, free of interference, often mixed with a fair bit of eccentricity. The independent state of Aramoana is a bit of an outlier in some respects. The micro nation of 250 local citizens was a product of the burgeoning environmental movement. Its very survival depended on winning minds of the public and politicians at the time. That they did support extended well outside of the township, overseas even. Let's go back though a tad and get the lay of the land and the times. The environment became a political issue for the first time when Tiwai Point at the very bottom of the South Island was picked as a location for an aluminium smelter. In a country which only has traces of the base ingredient, alumina, that was to be bulk shipped in from Australia. Why the smelter went live in Southland in 1971 was the other key element required in the manufacturing process, power. That was to come from a dam constructed at 200 kilometres to the north, Manapuri. Manapuri was in the Fiordan National Park. Petitions were signed and marches were held. 
fantails flew off their perches. Folk musicians now had something else to sing about that didn't involve love and peace. T.Y. Point Smelter went ahead despite the opposition. What's more, another smelter was also on the drawing boards on Otago Harbour Board land at Aramoana. A decade or so prior to that, the Otago Harbour Board had also plans for a steel mill on the peninsula as well. In the process of building the new smelter, the township would have to go and the local environment, wetlands and the wildlife it attracted, trashed. As with Manapuri, opposition started immediately, as did the questions about where the power was coming from. No one in the country was particularly keen to subsidise a second smelter via their own power bill. The people who had most to lose were the locals. The Save Aramoana campaign began in 74. The local community looked to rally support up and down the country. This support came chiefly from environmental groups. The archetype Neil from the young ones. If you think I'm being a bit harsh here in my portrayal of 70s environmentalist protesters, these weren't your modern day guilt ridden green voting housewives from Epson who drive their children to school daily in their four wheel drive. These were sandal and sock wearing men who didn't play sport, ghast of horror, nor did they hunt. Women who were hairy and scary, way more than the men that's for sure, dressed like they were four again and off to a birthday party, about to get high from hundreds and thousands of sammies. Then there was the great unwashed who cared more about their power bills, stunk a brute, always forgot the lyrics to the national anthem but never the name of the All Blacks front row. Some of those from both blocks would end up literally fighting each other in the streets when the Springboks toured in 1981. To raise the profile and funds for their cause, on the 23rd of December 1980, Aramoana declared itself an independent state. Passports were issued and sold. Stamps as well. They're now worth a bundle, by the way. Your once relegated happy with a cause relative may actually have something of value in their estate, apart from their pressings of Bob Dylan and Joan Baez in mono, naturally. They also had a travelling embassy. Okay, it's a caravan. Mind you, it's more than what Sealand has. Outside the region, the environmentalists were at the forefront of the campaign and bust in from Christchurch, etc. In 1981, that was the year New Zealand encountered its first widespread unpeaceful protests. Kiwi fought Kiwi on the streets. Following five weeks of anarchy in New Zealand, the vast middle ground had no real appetite for protest. It looked as if the smelter would be on the starting blocks, sneak through to the keeper almost by default. Only... As with the video I did on uranium mining in New Zealand, with it the proposal to open a nuclear plant north of Auckland, to follow after this one and there's a link in the description, it was capitalism that came riding over Mount Cargill and down the peninsula to rescue the township, wetlands and wildlife. The three partners in the smelter consortium were Fletcher Challenge, and an Australian company called CSR. These days they've changed their tack, it seems, more into building materials. And a Swiss-owned multinational aluminium company called Alu Suisse. The Swiss had got cold feet. They pulled the plug in late 81. The government of the day had backed the second smelter. It fitted nicely into their Think Big policies. The ones that brought the country to the verge of bankruptcy meant you had to lock your car in the garage for one day a week for a year. Time was being called on the interventionist national government. Whilst Fletcher's and CSR scrambled for a new partner with global experience and the clout to undertake a project of this nature, inflation was ravaging at 17%. 
a sobering number for those that complain about 7% today. Home loans were at 18%. The solution, according to Muldoon, for all that economic trauma was to freeze wages. As householders were getting squeezed from all sides, the public's anger began to focus on the sweet power deal Kamelko at T.Y. Point had. The coup de grace for Aramoana came, though, when the global price for aluminium slumped. It was no longer worth the investment required. The final blows for number two. Nine years of campaigning resulted in victory for the Save Aramoana campaign, and at the same time, the curtain fell on two and a bit years of the independent state. It's a great pity this sleepy township is forever tarnished with the events of the 13th of November 1990. Let's now change the paradigm, viewers and subscribers of interesting things. Whenever the name Aramoana crops up with a cheery disposition and cheeky smile, let us be the ones who regale tales of the independent state of Aramoana instead. The border post, flag on the hill, passports, supporters in England and Thailand, to name but a few. That travelling embassy, coat of arms. Associate Aramoana as the plucky town who gave the two-fingered salute to big business and government of the day. Winners. Thanks for stopping by today. If this video spun your wheels, be a good sort, in fact the best sort in the world, go ahead and share it and spot you next time. Bye for now.